Today's message is a topical message. We're going to be looking at a very uh, popular passage of scripture, Jeremiah 29, 11. You guys know it. The, the Bible says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. For the next few moments, I want to speak to you under the title of the ultimate will of God the ultimate will of God. Let us pray. Dear Jesus, Lord, our hearts are more than ready. Uh, we've gotten a glimpse into your throne room, into the, the sound of the, what the angels sing. And God, we're asking that you would move in our hearts, that you would open our minds to understand more about you and that you would have your way in this place. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. If I were to ask you, what is your earliest memory? I mean, if you can reach back into your memory bank, what's the first memory that you can remember? I don't know what you would say, but for me, my first memory, and I don't know what we were doing, I don't know where we were coming from, but I do remember being held in my mother's arms and it was nighttime. And I remember looking up into the sky, and this is actually not only my first memory, but my first thought. I remember looking up in the sky and thinking, why is the sky covered in glitter? <laughs> Later on, I would find out that's not glitter, that's the stars. And how fitting for me that that's the first memory that I can remember because I've always been fascinated by the stars and I've always loved learning about the stars. Even today, I follow a bunch of NASA pages and things like that. And I love seeing the new images from the James Webb telescope and all those things. And one of my favorite places to go stargazing was actually the roof of my house. Now my parents, they don't know that if they're watching, I'm sorry, that's what I used to do growing up. But my, my dad would always be fixing the roof and we kind of had kind of like a, not, not, not a pointy roof, but more of a flat roof. And my dad had this easy way to get up to the roof and I found out. And so at night, sometimes I would go up, I bring a blanket with me and I would just lay there. Just me and the stars. And this became a place of safety a place of refuge, a place of comfort, a place of awe and wonder at God's work. And it was my senior year of high school when I really gave my life to Christ for the first time, like for real. And I remember, you know, senior year, I'm not sure if there's any seniors in here, but senior year is a tough year. Not academically, I actually believe that junior year is your toughest year in high school because you have all the classes and things you're getting, you're ready for senior year. Senior year, what makes it so difficult isn't the academics, it's more of the emotional stress, right? Everyone's asking you, what college are you going to? What are you gonna major in? What are you gonna do? And so you have all these questions about the future. And this was me in my senior year. And after I gave my life to Christ, I started had, having some doubts about my plans and things that I had in, you know, in mind to do. And I remember going up to my familiar place, laying out there, you know, all the stars are out and I was looking up in the sky as if I was looking at God and I asked God, God, what is your will for my life? What do you want me to do? <laughs> Where do you want me to go? God, what is your will for my life? And I can bet that's a question that all of us have asked before, that we've wondered about, that we've pondered upon. God, what is your will for my life? Now, what's interesting is that this is a question that we usually ask when there's a big decision to make, right? Whether that's what college to go to, what, you know, what, what major to major in, what house to buy, you know, what occupation to go into or transition into. Usually we ask this question when there's a big life decision to make. And this is a noble question. It's an honest question. It's a sincere question. But you know, in the book, Experiencing God by Henry Blackaby, he tackles this question for most of the book. And in this book, which changed my life, one of my mentors gave it to me. And as I'm reading this, he talks about that question, God, what is your will for my life? And he says, that's a good question to ask, but there's a better question to ask. Simply ask God, what is your will? Because once you know God's will, then you can apply it to your life. We need to ask the question, God, what is your will? God, what do you desire? God, what do you want? 
And biblically, what we find is that God has many desires. God has many wills. God has many wants. In our scripture focus, Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plan to give you hope and a future. Sometimes with some of these verses, we quote it so often that it becomes uh, mundane, but notice the word there is plans. I know the plans I have for you, it's in the plural, it's not just a plan. And for me, that's so encouraging because sometimes we, we feel like God's will is linear. And the moment we mess up plan A, well, that's it, we, we, you know, we've messed up. But what I find in, in scripture is that when you know, Abraham messed up plan A, God had plan B. And when David messed up plan B, God had plan C. And over and over again, we see that God's will and his plans for our life are many. It's not just one plan, but he has many plans for our life. In fact, the word in Hebrew here really is talking about thoughts. For I know the thoughts I have for you, the ideas, the dreams, the plans I have for you. And can you imagine being the prophet Jeremiah, which we call him the weeping prophet. I mean, he has a whole book called Lamentation where he's just weeping and crying out to God. And can you imagine being Jeremiah and hearing that over you? Jeremiah, don't you understand? I have so many plans for you, you can't even comprehend. I have so many thoughts about you and for you, and they're good, that they won't harm you. They'll give you a bright future. And so what we find is that God has many desires, many wants, many wills. In Isaiah chapter 25, verse one, it echoes this where it says, Oh Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name for you have done wonderful things, plans formed of old, faithful, and sure. There we have that word again, not just plan, but he has plans. And this is the same word in Jeremiah 29 that's talking about the thoughts and the dreams he has for us. This is also echoed in Psalm chapter 40, verse five, where the psalmist writes, many, O Lord my God, are the wonders you have done and the plans you have for us none can compare to you. And I love this part. He says, if I proclaim and declare them, there are more than I can count. So what the psalmist is saying is, hey, listen, God has so many plans, so many wonderful plans for us that if we were to count them, we wouldn't even be able to because that's how many plans he has for our lives. And so the one thing is for certain that God has many plans for our life. He has many desires for our life. And with this as a backdrop, it leads us to understanding God's will. First thing you have to understand about God's will is that God has a will. In Matthew 6, uh, with the Lord's prayer, the disciples are overwhelmed. Perhaps they were hearing Jesus pray to his father and they're like, whoa, this dude prays completely different. It's, it's different than anything we've ever heard before. And they come to him and ask him, Lord, teach us to pray. And in the Lord's prayer, a part of it in Matthew 6, verse 10 is, your kingdom come, your what? Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, right? So very clearly we see that God has a will, right? And so when we ask this question, God, what is your will for my life? Perhaps, I just like to imagine, perhaps one of the responses from God would be, well, my child, I have many plans for your life. I have many desires for your life. I have many good thoughts for your life. And so biblically what we find is that God has many wills. What do I mean by this? If you look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3, it tells us that it is God's will that you should be sanctified. That word there is pure or set apart. So part of God's overarching will is for us to be sanctified by his, by his blood. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, talks another aspect of God's will. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you. And here's a key part, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So part of the will of God isn't only for us to be sanctified, but it's really for everybody, for all who is willing to come to repentance and know God for themselves. And so that's a part of God's will. One more, Micah chapter six, verse eight. I love the NET, how it puts it. He has told you, O man, what is good and what the, what the Lord really 
wants from you. He wants you to carry out justice, to love faithfulness, and to live obediently before your God. So we see that God's will is multifaceted. And we could be here all day quoting different scriptures about God's will. But what I want us to look at and ponder is what is God's ultimate will? Like, what does he desire most? What does he really, really want from us? And this question, how we answer it, dictates everything. It dictates the way we view God, the way we view his word, and even how we worship God. And so how would you answer this question? What is the ultimate will of God? What does God desire most? Perhaps someone might say holiness, right? First Peter chapter five, be holy as I am holy. And you can make an argument for that, that God wants us to live out a life of holiness, to be set apart and sanctified, just like we read. Perhaps someone might say glory, that what God wants is for him to be glorified in us and through us. Right, Zechariah chapter two, verse five, for I declare the Lord will be a wall of fire around her and I will be the glory in her midst. So God wants to be glorified in us and through us. Perhaps someone might say worship, right? God wants us to worship him with all our hearts. Psalm 150, verse six, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord, right? So you can make all these different arguments and I'm not saying one is wrong, but I believe in my estimation, that the ultimate will of God, that what God desires most can be summed up in one word. That one word is intimacy. Intimacy. More specifically, relational intimacy. I mean, if we really think about why we were even created in the first place, we were created to be in a love relationship with the Father. I mean, we could think about Adam and Eve and how they just had, uh, you know, this unadulterated presence of God all around them. They were able to talk and walk with God, right? We were created to be in a love relationship with God. In other words, what God wanted was true and authentic love. What he wanted was real love, was true love. And we know that in order for there to be authentic love and true love, there needs to be freedom. The way I like to explain it in my, you know, when I, was, when I was teaching in the classroom is I would call it the love equation, right? That love requires freedom and freedom requires risk. And what is that risk that a free willed individual could one day wake up and say, you know what? I'm not feeling this. And they could walk out. Right? And this is one of the reasons why I believe a lot of people nowadays, they struggle with commitment, right? Because inherently we're absolutely terrified of that risk, right? Of that person who you are trying to love with all your heart one day says, you know what? No, I don't love you, right? So there's risk involved in true love. But here's the thing, true love is worth the risk. And we know this because this is exactly the situation God himself finds himself in, right? But he knows that true love is worth the risk. I love this quote from Henry Blackaby in Experience of God. I don't want you to miss this. He says this, he says, God created you for a love relationship with him. He yearns for you to love him and respond to his immeasurable love for you. And I love that, the immeasurable love of God, because really, when we think about God's love, God's love really is like an ocean and we're just dipping our toes in the water and we will grow in love and we'll know him more and more. And perhaps that's why the Apostle Paul in the great love chapter of scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, he says, these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is, is love. Now, what's interesting about this, I remember the first time reading this, I was like, Paul, what are you talking about? I mean, faith is extremely important. Hope is extremely important. In fact, you know, the Bible talk, when it talks about faith, that it is impossible to please God without faith, right? So faith is important. Hope, the Apostle Paul also talks about that without the hope of resurrection, life is absolutely meaningless, right? So hope is important. But yet he says the greatest of these is love. Wonder why that is. Could it be because when we see Jesus face to face, the faith we had in him will be complete, right? What about hope? 
the hope of resurrection, the hope of, uh, of seeing him for ourselves. Once we see Jesus face to face, our hope is complete. What about love? See, our love will continue to grow, will, will continue to, to, to be fostered. It's like a never ending well that will never run dry. And so love truly is the greatest of them all. And I truly believe the more and more I, I, I talk with the youth, the more and more I look at, at the research, I just believe that in our hearts, there is this yearning to love and be loved. And I believe that's because God placed a God-shaped hole in all of our hearts. But the thing is that a lot of, a lot of times we end up filling it with things that can never truly satisfy. We, we fill it with things of this world versus the things of God. And so one thing that we all have in common on this earth is that we want to love and be loved. And we know that some of the greatest heartbreaks come when we love someone with all our hearts, and yet they don't love us back, right? When you give up everything to love this person, but it's not reciprocated. And, and then why does this hurt so much? I believe because in, innately, we were created with a desire to love and be loved. And this points back to the ultimate desire of God, the ultimate will of God, which is intimacy. And for me, this has changed everything. It's changed the way I view scripture, the way I worship God. And really, for example, I wanna take the 10 commandments. Uh, the 10 commandments, a lot of times we, we see it as straight, just laws. But when you look at the 10 commandments, I like to see it as the 10 vows, right? We're familiar with the concept of vows, right? If you've been to a wedding or your own wedding, you, you, we make these vows, and that's a really emotional, intimate part of the, the wedding ceremony. Why? Because the vows are exclusively for the couple, right? When Nayeli made her vows to me, it was special because it was strictly for me. It wasn't for anybody else, but for me, right? When I made my vows to her, it was exclusively for her and no one else. And these vows or these promises, we say it in seconds or minutes, but really they take an entire lifetime to live out. Right? And so the Ten Commandments as vows, I mean, when we really think about it, the Ten Commandments are the gateway and the foundation for relational and social intimacy with God and with one another. Because the reality is, how can you be intimate with God if you're serving other gods, right? How can you say, God, I'm exclusively serving you, but I'm gonna go serve other gods? You can't, right? How can you be intimate with God if you're worshiping an idol, right? Saying, God, I'm only gonna serve you, but I'm gonna go serve this idol. You can't. Right? How can you be intimate with God if you're taking the Lord's name in vain? And just so we're clear on what this is actually talking about, it's not just saying OMG, right? I mean, that's a part of it, but it's bigger than that. This is talking about if you're claiming to take the Lord's name over your life, to say, I am a follower of the Most High, I'm a follower of Yahweh, and yet your life is living co completely uh, contrary to that, you're taking his name in vain with the way you live your life, right? So not only with you know, how can we be intimate with God? But what about one another? How can we be intimate with our parents if we're not honoring them, right? If we're dishonoring them? How can you be intimate with others, the people around you that you love, if you're murdering, stealing, committing adultery, giving false testimony and coveting, right? You can't. The 10 vows are a gateway to understanding the foundation of God's love for us and the love for one another. You may be, you may be saying, Pastor John, you forgot a really important one. You forgot commandment number four, the fourth vow, the Sabbath. Listen, I actually believe that the Sabbath is the greatest example of horizontal and vertical intimacy. Because on the Sabbath, we're all one. There's no distinction among us. We're one before the Lord. And it points back to the God who created everything. It didn't just peace out and say, all right, see ya. No, he creates everything. And on the seventh day, he stops creating and he starts relating. He gets close and intimate with Adam and Eve. He gets close with his creation. So the Sabbath points back to this amazing God of love whose desire is relational and social intimacy. I absolutely love this quote from Wayne uh, Mueller as he's reflecting on the Sabbath. Note this, he says, like a path through the forest, Sabbath creates a marker for ourselves. So if we are lost, we can find our way back to our center. I love that, that the Sabbath is marked that, that we can go back to the center of recognizing what God truly wants from us. This great God that created the universe, 
desires to be intimate with his creation. So you guys get, getting what I'm saying when it comes to 10 commandments? There really are vows, the vows of the foundation for intimacy. And perhaps that's why, perhaps, why the Bible loves to use this bridegroom imagery all throughout scripture, that we are a bride adorned for the great king who's coming back for us soon. So what is the will of God? The will of God is intimacy, relational intimacy. And I believe this is what Jesus was talking about in Matthew 6, verse 10. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What is he specifically talking about? I believe that when we think about heaven, right, Jesus is referring to God's desire for intimacy. That in heaven, all created beings are in close fellowship with God. All created beings are in the presence of God. They all have a deep love relationship with the Father. And that's what he wants for us. For us to experience that here and now, to come into the presence of God, to be transformed and changed by basking in his presence. That's what God wants for us. But you may be asking, Pastor John, that's all nice, but what is God's will for my life? Right? That, that's what I really want to know. Well, this is kind of the sermon in a sentence. This is the whole, what we've been building up to is this, that God's will for your life is for you to be in a deep love relationship with him and his creation. That's really what he wants. And you may be saying, but what about what college I should go to? What about my career change? What about what house I should buy? What about all these other decisions? And these are good questions. And guess what? I'm thankful that we serve a God that if you lack wisdom, you go to him, he'll lead you and guide you. But all of that comes second to his primary desire for your life which is for you to be in a close relationship with him. Everything else comes second, right? What God desires is for you to be close with him and to be light bearers of the good news. And what good news am I talking about? I'm talking about the good news that there is nothing holding us back from being in a love relationship with God. There is nothing, not sin, not death, nothing. Right? The veil of division between us have been, has been torn and we have direct communion with God. And that's the good news, right? That God isn't angry with you. No, the complete opposite. God longs to be with you. He longs for your heart. But there is a point of friction that we need to address. If God's ultimate desire is intimacy, what do you think Satan's main goal is, all right? Satan's main goal is to keep us at all costs from being intimate with God. He'll do anything, whatever he can to keep us away from God. He'll do it with temptations. He'll do it with shame. He'll do it with making us feel unworthy of his love. He'll do it with making us feel guilty of our past. He'll do whatever he can to make us feel like we don't deserve to be intimate with God. And if we're being honest, his tactics work and they work pretty well. We all know people who won't return to God or come to God because they feel too ashamed of their past. They feel like God won't accept them. They feel too sinful. And maybe some of us feel that way even here today. But here's the thing, that is a lie from the enemy. The enemy is the one trying to create that division between us. But God makes it clear in his word, Matthew 11 verse 28, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. God promises to give us rest. We just come. We come as broken as we are, as ashamed as we are, as guilty as we are. We come before Jesus. And not only do we come, but guess what? We don't leave the same way. Because as we're in his presence, he'll give us what our soul longs for, for that deep internal rest that only God himself can provide. So are you feeling weary? Are you feeling shameful? Are you feeling distant from God? Come, as the word says, come to me all you who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. So truly, if I could have one thing for our youth and young adults and really for all of us, that one thing that I would desire is for our young people and for all of us to abide with Jesus, 
to walk and talk with Jesus, to learn to cultivate a life of communing with Jesus, of making him first in our lives, to communicate with Jesus, to walk and talk with Jesus, to not just know about Jesus, but to truly experience him day to day. I love this quote from John Warren as he puts it. He says, refuse to be content with the knowledge of God. Insist on experiencing his presence. Don't get me wrong, the information will lead us to Jesus, but we can't stop there. We need to insist on experiencing the presence of Jesus. And the thing that we know is very clear, Revelation 3.20, God longs for us to open the door of our hearts. He wants us to experience it experience him in a powerful and mighty way. I want to end with the story. There was a, a youth in the, the youth group that I pastored in Texas. I didn't ask her to share the story, so we'll just name, we'll just call her Susan. That's not her actual name. But Susan, she would confide in me about her relationship with God. And she was dealing with a lot, a lot of past sins and, and different baggage that she was carrying. And one time she came to me and it's after a Vespers and she said, Pastor John, can I talk to you? I said, of course. And she told me, Pastor John, I'm just tired. <laughs> I've tried over and over and over again to connect with God, to be one with God. I, I, I feel like I've done everything I, I can, but I, I still haven't experienced him like in a real tangible way. And I just feel like giving up. And I said, Susan, can I ask you a question? And I don't want you to get offended. And she's like, okay, sure. I was like, when's the last time you've been to the secret place? She's like, the secret place? Pastor, what are you talking about? I'm talking about the place where it's just you, God, and his word. No distractions, nothing else, just you, God, and his word. And she got a little bit offended. She's like, Pastor John, I read my Jesus calling every single day. And I'm like, the Jesus calling is good. It's a tool. But I'm talking about just you, God, and the word of God by yourself. Unrushed time, unhurried time, just you sitting with God and reading his word. And she thinks to herself for a little bit. She's like, Pastor John, you know what? Honestly, it's been a while. Every time I, I open up my devotional, it's, I'm always on the go. There's always the next thing, the next thing. But it's been a long, long time since I've, I've had unrushed, unhurried time with God. I said, Susan, let, let, let's try something. For the next seven days, what I want you to do, is I want you to wake up early, you know, earlier than you usually wake up. I said, leave, leave at least 30 minutes so you can spend unrushed, unhurried time. And she looks at me like, well, that's going to be kind of hard. I'm like, I know it's going to be hard, but if you can't do it, I mean, this is worth it. This is it's the, uh, eternal value, right? And she's like, okay, so 30 minutes or however long, but at least 30 minutes that we can spend unrushed, unhurried time. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to go ahead and observe Jesus. I want you to see the way that he talks to, to the disciples and the people around him. I want you to observe Jesus, to study Jesus, to use your imagination as, as he's talking with the, the different people in the stories. And I want you to go through the gospel of John. All the gospels are good, but you know, John right away hits you with the divinity of Jesus. So go ahead and you know, a chapter each day, read uh, the gospel of John. She's like, all right, pastor, I'm gonna try it. Next seven days, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and read a chapter of the Bible, unrushed, unhurried time, in a secret place with God. About four days later, she gives me a call. And before I can even say hello, she's like, Pastor John, Pastor John, are you there? I'm like, yes, is everything okay? I was a little worried. She sounded like frightened or something, something happened. She's like, Pastor John, I just have to tell you what just happened. I was like, okay, go ahead and tell me. She says, today I was studying John chapter four, the woman at the well. And I've heard the story all my life, but for the first time, I was really just digging into the story for myself. And after a while of reading the story and seeing how Jesus, you know, points out the sins of the woman, I realized something. I realized that I had never truly confessed to Jesus my sins. That I've never asked for forgiveness. And in that moment, I started to feel just this, this weight of guilt rush through, rush through my mind, this weight of shame. And I felt unworthy of his love. I felt like, what, what am I doing here trying to connect with the God of the universe when, I, when I'm too sinful? I, I don't deserve this kind of love. And, she, and this is the next part where, 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 as she's saying it, she's almost crying and trying to make out the words. She's like, Pastor John, and as I'm thinking these thoughts, I don't know what happens, but it's, it was like a fire in my soul, a fire in my heart. And I felt almost like this embrace. And I felt like God was telling me, child, you are forgiven. You are mine. 
And I praise God for that because as I'm talking with her and I, you know, she's tearing up, I, I'm, I'm tearing up as, as she's sharing this and saying you know, that she felt this shame, this, this guilt. And really, we see the great controversy at display right there where Satan's trying to make her feel unworthy and yet God's letting her know, no, 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 you are mine, you are forgiven. And I praise the Lord for that experience because even till today when I reach out to her, she'll bring up that, that story of being in the secret place with God. And I wanna challenge you. Yeah, if you're at a place where you feel distant from God, if you're in a place where maybe you haven't experienced God in a very long time and you're frustrated, you're anxious, you feel like, like giving up, I, I wanna challenge you to do the very, very same thing that I challenged Susan to do, to spend time in the secret place with God, to abide in, in his presence, to, to, to cultivate a life of spending unrushed, unhurried time with God because we know that the ultimate will of God is intimacy and God will not forsake his children. Lord Jesus, I wanna thank you so much for your word. I wanna thank you for the reminder that there is no division between us anymore, that you have conquered the grave. And I wanna thank you because nothing else shows us the fact that you desire intimacy more than the cross of Calvary. That Lord, that you would risk it all, that you would give it all so that we could be one with you. Lord Jesus, all we can say is thank you. Thank you for your love, for your grace, and thank you for all that you've done for us. Lord, I just wanna pray for those uh, here today who may be feeling just at the end of their rope with you. God, I wanna pray that they would set apart time to experience you in your word, to experience you in, 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 a, in a mighty, fresh, new way. God, we long to get to know you more. We long to walk and talk with you. And God, I'm asking that you would open our eyes and our hearts to see you more, to see you in the little things and in the big things, to walk and talk with you in a practical way. And as we come to you, I pray that we won't leave the same, that we'll leave with your joy, with your peace, and whatever our soul longs for. We thank you and we praise you in the name of Jesus. Let everyone say, amen.